cik rerum sum manovatur semper. This is a quotation from Lucretius, and it translates thus. Thus, the sum of things is ever being renewed. Transformations. So, uh, the greater part, the larger part of my talk will be on this subject. Obviously, um, uh, referring to this book here, The Spirit of Metaphysics, and uh, going beyond a little going beyond a little too. Um, first, I will give a brief overview of the uh, spirit of metaphysics of this book, small book, and uh, begin with the first part, the logical theory of the universe, which uh, first deals with the doctrine of symbols. Now, the symbol, as I see it, is the medium through which our perceptions, after being perceived, after being perceived, pass. It is a veil, and they have to pass. We cannot will otherwise, even if we will consciously, otherwise, subconsciously, uh, the perceptions, after being perceived, pass through the sieve of the symbol. Now, what is the symbol? The symbol is the uh, placement or placing of any perception, any perception and all perceptions that we receive in its proper context, within the larger context, within the mass universe. It's placing its position, its site, gives it its importance, always speaking relatively, its importance, its uh, uniqueness, sometimes uniqueness, and also it gives the meaning uh, of things. And uh, when a particular person, um, regarding symbols, thinks, uh, more than normal, more than normal to, to other human beings by way of symbols, then he will be uh, approaching to the propensity to genius. Because uh, if we see literature, philosophy itself, science, all parts of civilization the more they are in the vicinity of a symbol, the more they would lead a person to a propensity of genius, which is something, I must remark here, I open a paraphrase, uh, that uh, it is something which all of us can do. All of us can be geniuses. But we have to sweat for it with that condition. And uh, then I pass to a second topic which is treated here. It is the doctrine of miracles. Now I think I have been very categoric here, although it was 1977 and I was much younger. And uh, in the doctrine of miracles, I made it very clear that miracles, number one, do exist. They do exist, but number two, they do not exist as religious phenomena. Three, they exist as scientific phenomena. And the existing as scientific phenomena means also that the miracles have their own rules, small rules, not much but small rules. Uh, one of those rules is the doctrine of controller and controlled, which is a doctrine in which matter energy, any matter energy in the mass universe is at one time, at one particular time and place, I call that an absolute time-space moment, 
is controller. That is, it controls some other part, albeit small, of the mass universe. Or it is controlled. It is controlled either by the rest of the mass universe or by a part of the mass universe. And this applies to everything that is in the mass universe. It is either at one moment in time controlled or controller. And it exchanges uh, its rows from controller to controller and vice versa according to the time and place in which uh, it locates itself. Then there is the laser principle, which was uh, originally, originally uh, put forth in the Middle Ages. It was criticized thoroughly by Renaissance and more so by modern philosophers. But I found that uh, in it there is some, some reasoning, and the reasoning is this. Uh, it is, for that time, although it was the Middle Ages, the razor principle was a medium of revolution, of uh, the tendency not to accept the knowledge of, I'll make limited, of those days, you see, and it contributed in a way, perhaps not large, to the uh, arising of the Renaissance. In the Renaissance it was uh, criticized, but it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, even today, it still contains requisites for knowledge which are initially accepted but then have to be seen against the scenario of the idea of infinity. I will be explaining what the idea of infinity is too. Uh, the laser departs from consuetudinary laws. It even, even in the Middle Ages, its function was precisely that, to depart from consuetudinary laws. And it is therefore an instrument of revolution and of evolution, two scenarios arise, the concept, the concept of ordinary on the one side, obviously we have to criticize that scenario always, and the evolutionary, that is the ever changing of the concept of ordinary and that uh, part of civilization which must control the concept of ordinary scenario all the time, for revolution, revolution to succeed. The same, uh, irrespective of whether we are in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance, today, in the future, if we are sure of uh, just a few number of things, we must be sure of this thing. We must, I underline, must be sure of this thing. Because if there is any moment, any and I underline any as well, in which the contents, let's say contents, of any culture, any civilization, are in any way, even to a very small percentage, dogmatized, then we are in the peril of becoming uh, fossilized uh, learners and teachers because uh, we must evolve all the time. But um, about evolution, now this brings me to the idea of infinity. Um, to go to the idea of infinity, I must uh, beg you recall Cogito Ergo Sum of Descartes. 
And uh, that is, I think, therefore I am. Now, in 1978, well, after thinking of uh, using the Cartesian methodology to find, to discover something for myself, I came to the dictum. I have the idea of infinity. From whatever it came, the same way as Descartes sorry, had the, the idea of, and said that we have, that was correct, the idea of thinking. Just as we have the idea of thinking and we cannot escape from it. We have also the idea of infinity. Like thinking, like the idea of thinking, we do not know where it came from. But whatever its origin, whatever its origin, even if we know its origin, do not, we do not, sorry, we do not know its origin, the idea of infinity is implanted into our minds. And once we have this idea in our minds, when we think, when I say I think, I say the same as Descartes said. But when we think, we think in an infinite manner. And I shall be explaining later on what, meaning, what we mean by thinking in an infinite manner. But what it proves, for the moment I will limit myself to this. What this proves, this proves that uh, thinking, <coughs> the idea of infinity, are something we cannot escape from. And they are something, they are perhaps one of the greatest uh, gifts that humans are endowed with. It shows humans that contrary to what is every day almost we are bombarded with, that we, uh, our brain, our reasoning is limited. You see, this is exactly the opposite. The brain, the faculties of the human are not limited. It depends on the human how much he exercises himself in the, quest, in the quest for culture and civilization to discover, to make discoveries, to enunciate principles in literature, to make great works. There is no limit. There is no limit at all. This is the idea of infinity. And then I will be um, uh, restricting it a little bit more, the idea of infinity, to what we perceive, our perceptions. Now, the uh, practically, I must say practically all the philosophers, not just Middle Age or Roman times or Greek times or the Renaissance, practically all philosophers by the term perception, they uh, mean, they signify to themselves, and also to us, unfortunately, uh, the perceiving of a particular thing or things. This must not be. It must be, but there must be something additional to it, something which is a gift given to us, we do not know how, but it is a gift given to us, the idea of infinity. So, when we have a perception, plus that perception, there is a zone, a clustering of other ideas, which we see vaguely, which we see vaguely, of which we have a vague idea only, but which in future, not all of us, I wish maybe all of us, uh, some of us discover from the hazy infinity which we see before us, 
we discover something which is specific. Just as we see, as we see this bottle of water, just as we see this grass, there is a big, a very big, a very increasing reservoir. And we have it inside us, from which, on which we can draw, and on which we can dig to uh, make our culture, our civilization, our civilization greater and better, and extend it, and extend it. I must also point out that there are two principles which are mentioned in this small work. They are the principle of derivative evolution, what I call the principle of derivative evolution, and the principle of relativity of evolution. All the, regarding the principle of derivative evolution, all that mixes together and uh, the mass universe and also uh, here on Earth, now here on Earth, there is the tendency for all matter energy, for all matter energy, to mix together continually, to transform continually. Without that, without these processes, we would not have the life process, for, for example. So, regarding the principle of derivative evolution, all that mixes, mixes its identity and the results in the birth of a new quality. In the principle of relativity of evolution, autonomy, which is relative, is everywhere. Evolution is proportionate to autonomy and vice versa. Um, uh, so much so that in, uh, the, in a part of the book, I also gave a a description, brief, very brief description of the process of through which anything must pass from the level of the what we call the inanimate, the non-living processes, to the living processes. I gave this uh, in uh, this book in eight stages. But later on in my life, I refined without compromising the principle of transformation from one side to the other, without compromising that principle, I refined on, on it. And uh, I will show, I hope if I have time, uh, something uh, of, and in that direction. Now at this point, I think I will have to start with the charts. With the chart number one, we already mentioned the idea of infinity, and uh, after analyzing many, many principles, generally of science, but of all branches of science, I came to and going upwards, just like in we do in the in genealogy. We go up a genealogical a genealogical tree. You arrive uh, uh, pointing towards the pyramid, the apex of the idea of infinity. We arrive at three so-called children of the idea of infinity. They're without many. <laughs> Um, uh, and they are the principle of global balance, number one. Two, principle of contiguous. These are philosophical principles. But at the same time, they are also principles of science. They are the principles on which all the sciences are founded and are to be founded so, the conclusion is, first, the 
science has its foundations in the philosophy and it cannot escape from this it has to have its foundations its genesis in the, in the philosophy now I will explain briefly what I mean by global balance principle of global balance no no ok you can leave it you can the second one in the principle of global balance everything in the mass universe that is from the realm of the mass universe ever expanding according to Hubble's law uh, we have a principle by which everything in the mass universe as a whole has to be stable one thing has to stay near its thing and not be unstable if it is unstable and there were moments in the mass universe where it was unstable if it is unstable then that particular thing will uh, be stabilized by the surrounding environment by its very own surrounding environment so everything in the mass universe must have this global balance and this means first genesis of the proportionality of things things are proportional because they, are, they also observe global balance the one with the other there is also when things are proportional they form graphically and you can imagine it in your minds a genesis of a genealogical tree of the mass universe that is everything in the mass universe is connected and related to one to the other I, I, I remember well Einstein had a dictum not about it was not uh, as technical but it was in the same direction discovery of principles also are made from the genealogical tree I hope to have some time and then also and I go back and these go back to the work here uh, there are symbols miracles control, control we already spoke a little about them and uh, what we did not speak about is the elimination which is done in this book of between the actual and the potential you would say what if I think of something I do not see it before me it is potential yes but it can be in another moment in another time actually in fact if I find uh, the place in the book where I where I treated this mother but I think yes uh, I will read verbatim a few lines from page, 20, from, from page 25 when I was speaking about the theory of an exhaustible hypothesis I said this hypothesis is possible due to the doctrine of conversion and of the ever changing and inexhaustible permutations and combinations of uh, conditions which we discussed earlier in the work but the hypothesis can in modern conventional philosophical terms be considered only as potential existence and it's so far that it is sharply differentiated from actual existence but in truth this is erroneous since hypotheses are infinitely continuous and we cannot negate this they are infinitely continuous not as very often we think them uh, time space absolute units infinitely continuous there is infinite time for the evolving into actual existence 
Hence, the hypothesis will always turn to being actuated, just as we've been saying. Only the potential hypothesis is antecedent to the succession in time, you know, in time to the being actual. Thus, the potential hypothesis will all become being actual due to the forms of being both infinite, and we refer to the idea of infinity, and continuous, ever shifting, ever evolving. Thus, the difference between potency and actuality in the universe is being eliminated. Gradually, we cannot do this uh, with the magician's wand and make it disappear at once. But gradually, as civilization, as civilization and culture increase, you see, the distance, the distance between uh, potency, what can be, the others say, I say, what is? Potency and actuality is diminished. If it is diminished in a, in a fast way, if they mean diminished in a fast way, it will be only a matter of centuries, you, you will excuse me, of its being eliminated. But it will. Only the potential hypothesis is antecedent to the succession of time. And uh, only actuality is subsequent to potency. Potency comes before. Actuality Actuality is the unfolding of potency in the future. And it is also and it is also given the, big, the whole context, the big context, the eliminator of the distance between the actual and the potential, gradually. Now I think uh, the same holds for the true force elimination. We're going to have another chart, I think. Yes, the principle of contiguous adjacent, adjacent reference frames. This is the second principle emerging from the idea of infinity. And uh, in it, all phenomena are locked in the reference frames. Reference frames give phenomena. First, their genesis. Because without the reference frames that enclose uh, matter, continuously transforming, tra transforming matter, there cannot be genesis. Same for structure, same for uniformity and the containment uh, of the normal uh, unfolding and continuous transformation of matter energy. This is the opposite of so-called cancerous growth. Instead of containment, we have the contrary. Combine the reference frames, first the mass universe, give the mass universe its orderly designed view. This, I have to say, that although many philosophers think that there is a predestined, like Leibniz, a predestined order or something like that, I am sorry to say that this is not the case. The uh, design, the order review of the mass universe comes from the combined reference frames. Then we pass to the third principle, mass energy percentage. This I based on E equal and C squared. And uh, first there is transformation of energy generated by expansion of the rim of the mass universe. The energy is initial, but as time goes on, more and more mass is, is uh, generated. I wish to elaborate, to, elaborate, to elaborate on this subject, but time is running against me. And I think that... Uh, you permit me? I have some notes. Very, very, very uh, small, I hope. So, uh, 
in brief, I would have liked to explain more. But even from the little that we saw, we saw that the uh, we started from purely philosophical uh, principles, so to say, and through them we crossed the bridge. We had a journey, a traveling, and at the end of the voyage, we landed in the world of the scientific. We touched the beginning of the scientific. And in my own work, I take, I carry on with this methodology. A methodology which I hope is carried on. You can have that bridge, that bridge. Uh, that is the methodology of going from philosophy to science. And that's why the spirit of metaphysics, which is the beginning of the book, in the end ends on a philosophical monograph on the logical theory of the universe. And uh, through this methodology, I discovered many scientific principles, still in draft form, and uh, also it even extends, although in a more limited way, to other fields like uh, sociological uh, subjects like economics, anthropology, sociology itself, and also in literature from uh, poetry to drama. I, I, I would have, and to the epic also, I would have wished to elaborate more, but time is cruel. So I think I have to end. I have to end? Is it? You have still more time. Uh, I have more time? Yeah, yeah. How much? How much? Five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes? Okay, fine. Um, so, I think we can have more slides. We can go to infinite perception, slide 5, extension of specific objects. This is the normal perception that we see. This model, this glass, this laptop. But then there are brain arrangements which are extensions, uh, sorry, there are extensions on extensions of A, that is, I see a number of specific things and I extend, I extend those things to other concepts. When I am writing or drafting scientific principles myself, I uh, tend to think, first of all, of principles which are near to those principles which I want to discover. When you want to discover something, first of all, start, which, which you still don't know, first of all, start thinking of that which is nearest to it, which is most adjacent to it, not the far, that which is most adjacent. And then, by extension, you will also discover things which were not discovered. You will extend specific objects which you observed that you did not extend before. You will make, and that's the third, brain arrangements, extensions as in A and B, but in a more intensified manner. I think we can have six. And I refer to perception, for example. In perception, uh, we have, again, four types. The first type is the normal, so-called type, we have been discussing. A second type of perception is the existential type, which is so often uh, neglected, if not always neglected as a perception, that, that we look at things from the prospect, from the prospect of the existential and the experiential. Something uh, as Kierkegaard did, 
uh, more than a century ago now. Also, third dimension, the infinite, that is perception scrammed into a few. I would tell them God-like perceptions, God-like in the sense of, of seeing everything. You see, seeing everything, imagine, you are on top and you see everything beneath you. And also the specific perceptions, which are a combination of the previous three. The ordinary specific perception, the existential or clear guardian one, and the infinite one. Perhaps there is time for another slide with processes and transformation. This is an example I changed from the processes and transformation as per this book. Past universe, <coughs> then motion from the rim, from the rim, that is the edge of the mass universe. In words, linear motion, the speed of the electrons is multiplied by the temperature of motion. This gives us the principle of the shape of motion. Then, the change of motion gives us the principle of shape of motion, which we have mentioned. Environment comes in too, but in the form of temperature here, yeah. plus boiling, which is a result of the environment temp temperature, and uh, this changes linear motion, which is in general the motion of so-called non-living things, to inverted a shape motion. It's like the motion of sperms, or like the motion. No, not like the motion, but it, it moves too when it, when it separates, like the helix of the DNA. You see, it is the same, what I call inverted ashamed motion. And we are, when we arrive at that uh, level, we are arriving at a very, very, very primitive, a very, very primitive form of life. From the non-living, we have arrived at the living. More time. I can also elaborate on the origin, but very briefly, on the origin of the mass universe. Uh, at the rim of the mass universe, there is always expansion. Lucretius, whom I quoted in the beginning, had uh, said, what sort? Throne in an, in, in an imaginative way. What sort of throne towards the, the edge of the mass universe that comes back to you? That's not. It always goes forward. And this was, in a way, a foreshadowing of Hubble's laws, Hubble's law, that the universe is always in constant expansion. Its rim is constantly expansion, expanding. And the very expanding of the rim of the mass universe, the very expanding, overlapping one on the other, creates the first energy, E of E squared. But it is uh, all, almost 100% energy at that time. Then this energy falls back into the mass universe and then falling back into the mass universe following Einstein, the energy becomes a little mass, then more mass and more mass. But there is an equation which is always observed and then there is the beginning of things. <laughs> Sorry, it is there. The mass increases always. Then when it increases to a certain extent, it starts transforming. And it starts transforming over millions of years. Over, And we see that uh, we started from these principles, from purely philosophical principles. Cross the bridge and came to the beginning, to the foundation of science. I wish very much that you keep this in mind, that the foundation of science is in the philosophy. 
in the Buddha. This is the philosophy. I, this is the gist of what I have been saying. I wanted to say more than this. But I think I made a gist of what I had to say. And the, the final gist is philosophy. I, I have been repeating it about five, six times. Philosophy is the foundation of science. The principles of philosophy are the, the principles, are the, sorry, are the foundation of the principles of science. I beg you to bear this in mind. Thank you very much for hearing my presentation and sharing with you.